that, folks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, as an engineer, uh, it's always very useful. I think I actually get more out of these conferences than you guys will get from me. Um, I've been studying the aortic valve uh, since I was uh, probably a master's student. And um, uh, much of it, I think obviously uh, most of you here probably know far more about the physiology of the valve than I do, certainly in a clinical setting. But it's an absolutely amazing structure in terms of its, what it does. And as far as I know, there's no man-made equivalent that has this level of durability of at least uh, three to four billion cycles over a course of a single lifetime, which for most people goes completely without any maintenance or oil changes. And, um, and so what its function though is really simple. The basic idea is to prevent retrograde blood. It's just a, simply a blood directional uh, controller. It's a valve and that's the end of it. Well, not quite so simple. Um, the, obviously being an engineer, I always have to show the obligatory Da Vinci picture. Um, and actually there's an interesting story how he actually did these pictures, in case you're wondering how he, uh, he actually took uh, cadaveric valves and animal valves and soaked them in oil of wintergreen to make them clear and then put together a simple flow system using poppy seeds so he could see how the flow worked. And if those of you have ever seen modern uh, particle image velocimetry studies, the principle is the same, and he did this back in about 1500. Very smart guy, but you knew that already. Um, but the basic idea is that there's a very highly specialized coupled system going on here that it belie, you know, maybe at first looks pretty simple, but gets quite um, more complex. Now, the clinical motivation, as most of you know, probably far better than I do, is of course uh, aortic sclerosis and insufficiency, usually very secondary to calcific aortic valve disease. And the question is, is how do we understand this process? Now, this is very interesting for me because when I first got into this um, business um, in the early 90s, uh, most of the bioengineering uh, meetings were focused on valve replacements, new methods of chemical fixation, very little on the disease itself. Um, and now there's much more and a much deeper appreciation and understanding of, cal of the mechanisms of calcific aortic valve disease, which I think, and the engineers have really gotten into this, as you can see. Now, this is an extremely complex process. I don't claim to understand all the underlying biochemistry. Much of it's dictated by under uh, cell signaling and so on. But there are many, many biochemical mechanisms that are also triggered by the very unique physical environment of the valve. And in particular, the, uh, there's multiple layers, as we'll get into in a minute, and there's actually thought to be a layer-specific uh, susceptibility to the valve, depending on what side, what location, and so on. So as you probe deeper and deeper, and you peel away the layers of the onion, you'll find it gets much more interesting. Now, as an engineer, I tend to look at things more from a systems point of view. That is, I, I'm not so interested in the reduction of science as I'm interested to understand how the whole thing works together. And I think in terms of how we look at it, this little slide we put together over the years really shows from an organ level valve to a multi-layered structure. One of the things you want to ask yourself is why there are three layers? Why not just one? It's just the leaflet, right? Um, and these are, have very complex structures of dense fibrous collagen, uh, glycosaminoglycans, uh, and then a very co interesting uh, elastin collagen ridge layer. And if you go further down, you'll see these are populated by a fairly, for a dense connective tissue, fairly large amount of, it's called the valve interstitial cells. And these guys are very, very, have very synthetic. Um, and f f compared to other tissues, for example, like cartilage or tendon, they have about a 10% volume uh, fraction, which is about three to five times that of these other tissues. Now, if you look at the biomechanics of, of the aortic valve leaflet, uh, some years ago, one of my former students and I you know, would take the leaflets out, we would cut square sections, and right away you can also see the complex uh, fiber structure of this leaflet. And then if you actually put it up to a little testing device where you could pull on it in multiple directions, uh, you could actually see that the effective stress-strain curves are really quite different. So already we're seeing layers of complexity where it's not just a simple homogenous flap. There are actually very high areas of specialization. And one of the things that really interested me is that this is all made primarily out of collagen type 1. Very, very strong protein. Uh, breaks about 8 to 10 percent strain, but how, can you, how do you actually make a leaflet that deforms 10, 80, 90 percent strain in one direction from those fibers. And, the, and it does this not from changes in, by changing the fibers, but by changing 
how they, they're allowing them to rotate. So you imagine this is a little square, and as you increase the loading in the radial direction, the fibers don't really straighten out, but they're allowed to rotate, and the structure of the valve is designed to allow this. And those people who come from a textile literature um, have, have actually used this, exploited this in a number of applications. Um, so if you look at just in summary, it's a response to very low pressure gradients. If you pick up the leaflets, they're very floppy, very soft and flexible until you pull on them, and then they're extraordinarily strong. And they do this largely by these very unique um, uh, stress-strain curves where you have this long compliant region that stiffens. And if you notice, the two major directions are quite different. This is called mechanical anisotropy. Now, let's get down into the microstructure. So one of the things that the first thing you notice is why there are multiple layers. And they're actually not really been solved until just recently. They all have different constituent fractions, they have different architectures, and they have different distinct mechanical behaviors. And the question is, why is that? And if you go further in to the structure of these, these uh, layers, they're really quite complex. You have a dense, uh, in the fibrosa layers, mostly type 1 collagen. Spongiosa is a glycosaminoglycan rich layer. And a ventricular layer, this is very interesting elastin uh, collagen composite. And we actually went through, did some very detailed analysis of these. And if you look here, you'll find the collagen, of course, is mostly concentrated in the fibrosa, very little in the spongiosa, and some in the ventricularis. Uh, gags are mostly in the spongiosa, but present throughout the valve, and elastin a little bit in the fibrosa, which is usually not appreciated, but obviously mostly in the ventricularis and com usually completely absent. Now, one of the questions I sometimes get asked are, are these really distinct layers? And really, the way we look at them is as a functional continuum. Um, you can physically spread them out and separate them. Um, histopathologists like to say these are distinct layers. I see them more as a continuum. Now, without going into detail, we just recently published a very detailed model on how we can separate these uh, layers. And what we find in the circumferential direction is that the fibrosa bears most of the stress of ventricularis, just a small fraction. But in the radial direction, the, the ventricularis adds a great deal. And so essentially what the uh, uh, ventricularis layer does is, it, to some extent, is a supporting layer for the, to prevent over distensions in the radial direction during forward flow. And this does this largely through a of the elastin network as well. Now, getting down into the valve itself, in, from the cell level, um, the uh, interstitial cells are very critical uh, for maintenance and upkeep, and uh, there's a lot of evidence indicate that um, these cells are extremely metabolically active for dense connective tissue. For example, um, the amount of what's called thermally labile collagen, that is the amount of collagen that's been newly deposited, is very, very high in valves, particularly the mitral valve, compared to other dense connective tissues. So there's a lot of evidence to indicate the valves aren't so much um, repaired, and, but they're more maintained. Actually, they're constantly turned over. Um, and given their physiological critical function, it's not a big surprise. This is all done by the interstitial cells. And they're highly synthetic, they're myofibroblasts, and they're part of it means they have alpha smooth muscle actin as a primary, one of the major markers, and they're very, very sensitive to physical stimuli. So in other words, they, they, actually the physical environment is very important for how they maintain. And that's not a big surprise. You can see how uh, intimately connected they are to the extracellular matrix, and in particular, they have an extraordinarily large nucleus. So we actually see um, a lot of interrelationships between those, and in particular, in, in uh, valve diseases and, uh, and also particularly during growth, they can uh, phenotypically switch from quiescent to activated uh, phenotypes. Um, and so they're actually pumping out not only a lot of external matrix proteins, but also the associated proteases and their inhibitors. Now, a few years ago, we did some studies on the mechanical properties of the cells. We actually were the first ones to do this. Um, so it was a little bit of an adventure. And we used a technique called micropipette aspiration. This is where actually you can remove the cells, a very classic technique. It's really designed for circulating cells, not for interstitial cells. But we actually found, interestingly, when we look at the properties of all four valves, the cells from all four valves, that the left side valves, that the mitral and aortic over here, are about, ooh, twice as stiff as the right side valves. And this is very interesting. The question is, why is that? And we did some subsequent measurements where we look at the amount of smooth muscle actin and the amount of HSP47, which is a collagen chaperone gene. And what that does is basically uh, indicate the amount of collagen. The short of it is, is that cells that are stiffer 
exhibit more SMA and also produce more collagen. So essentially, the left side valves are highly, much more highly synthetic than the right side valves. Now, let's re rewind now back to what's important clinically. What I've tried to do is give you a very quick overview of some of the different, what we know at the different scales. Um, and one of the things that I've been working on with my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania is this bicuspid aortic valve disease, which I'm sure all of you know very well. It's the most common uh, cardiac congenital defect. And the anomaly is, uh, one of the things that we're very interested in is can you use any of this biomechanical knowledge in terms of patient diagnosis and prediction of disease, monitor progression of disease, repair, and also in the uh, design of artificial valves, which is still very much a, an advanced area of research. Now, the bicuspid valve is a really interesting anomaly, and I, we did some ar um, architectural studies uh, a couple years ago from human explants. Um, if you look at the normal valve, the normal valve um, using Picrocerius red is extremely well structured. The bicuspid valve, on the other hand, is, can be very anomalous. Now, I want to draw your attention to these structures here. This suggests the anomaly is not at the fiber level, but at the layer level. So this is almost like, I use the analogy if you make those layered cakes, um, and you have like a white layer, a chocolate layer, white layer, chocolate layer. Before you bake it, you take a spoon and just mix it up, and then you cook it. What's happening there is that the layers get mixed up. And you can see that really here. This is a large um, su section or chunk, if you will, of elastin fibers, which really should be the ventricularis, stuck up in near the ventricularis, uh, I mean in the fibrosa in the Rafe region. So this anomaly is actually quite peculiar and has some very interesting, it's not a random disarray of fibers is what I'm getting, but it's a more organized anomaly. So one of the things you want to be able to do is to say, is there some type of population-based metrics that you can measure to be able to look at things that to uh, better inform the diagnosis of this disease, including backing out things like functionally elastic properties, uh, shape, and so on. And you actually need to determine a lot to do this. Uh, imaging, uh, sensitivity, properties, and anything that you do in engineering, of course, means extensive validation. As I always tell my students, if you make a model or come up with an analysis, if you were going to build a bridge out of it, would you walk over it? And uh, these are not trivial things. So one of the things that's kind of driving this is, in fact, I would say in the field of biomechanics, is largely driven by what you can measure. And what's happened, particularly in the last 10 years, is the phenomenal ability to reconstruct the valve anatomy from uh, a 3D echo. Uh, and um, imaging modalities are always competing with each other. But one of the things that we've done with, uh, in collaboration with Allison Pouch in the Gorman Lab is come up with these very nice 3D reconstructions of the aortic valve. We're not the only ones who do this, but um, Allison claims this is automated, uh, but I look at it as I say, Allen to segment this, and a couple days later she sends me the segmentation, so that's all I care about. Um, now, if we look at the architecture of the leaflets, this is the normal human, and this is using a, uh, an optical technique where the color scale indicates how well the fibers are aligned. Uh, warmer colors mean more aligned, cooler mean less aligned. And this is what's so-called the normal bicuspid valve, that is one where there's no refe. So it really looks like a normal valve, just sort of stretched out. Um, now what you can do is then take the 3D reconstruction, uh, map it, and actually take that fiber structure and map it back to actual 3D geometry of the reconstructed leaflet. And you do this through a series of spline techniques that we develop. And you can map, uh, this actually allows you to not only look at a single valve, but most importantly, pool the valves together into a single common geometry. And uh, you can also look at things like the lengths um, and so on. BAVs tend to be longer in their geometries, which is not a big surprise. But more importantly, you see this. Now, um, this is the normal human tricuspid. I think it's about a dozen patients. Uh, this is the bicuspid valve. Now, the first thing, I was a little surprised at these results because I thought the bicuspid valve would just be a mess. But actually, it's not. It's mainly in the refe, and this is orientation index and mean direction. This is an average of about 15 valves. So what you're beginning to see, there are actually some population-specific trends. Now, these are precalcific patients, so there's, there's not a lot of tissue degeneration. Um, so they were carefully chosen for that reason. And it says that there may be some ability to do some diagnosis of this. And then, of course, you can, as I said before, you can pull all this right back to the patient-specific geometry. 
uh, and then you can actually 3D reconstruct those. Now, I want to say that for the way we built these models up, we actually averaged, the, we actually knew the 3D geometry and the architecture of each patient leaflet. And the other thing you can get from these now is that if you look at the reconstructions, you can actually get the shape uh, open and closed. And from that, you can actually compute the deformations of the leaflet, which is not trivial. Um, and this is actually done the similar way where we go through an analysis pipeline and we use our spline technique and divide it up into these regions. Okay. And what you see, you now it's very interesting here, is that we not only look at the open, this is the area of the leaf at open, just coapted, fully closed. Of course, it goes up, which you'd expect. But because these were taken from surgical valves, we actually looked at the excised valve geometry. And what this indicates very clearly is that the aortic valve leaflet, even in the fully open state, is actually under a fair amount of pre-strain. So it's actually stretched out bef before it goes in vivo, if you will, by quite a bit. And we think this is largely due to what the function of the elastin structure does, is to maintain that. And we actually look at different shapes and geometry. So you can actually get all of this from 3D ultrasound. And then we can actually go through this analysis and compute the strains of the leaflet. And uh, these are at different states. I don't have time to, this has all been published, and I'll be happy to talk to you about this at the meeting. But the, most of the deformations, as you can see, are in the radial direction. But if you go from ex vivo to in vivo, that is taking it out of the patient, putting it back in, you see some interesting things going down here near the root where there's actually a lot of stretching out. So that basal attachment is a very detailed and subtle area. So ultimately, what we want to be able to do is combine all this information to say, can we extract using computational methods what we call an inverse model? This means that we have a mechanical model, and we want to be able to determine the parameters on a patient-specific basis with the idea of using this for patient stratification. And we tested this out on some biopersetic valve uh, data we collected a few years ago. And again, we can take the architectural maps and add these all, do these. And this potentially could be done the same way in a patient. Um, and we use our material model where we look at the undulations of the collagen fibers and then how they uh, amass. I go, we'll go into detail of this, but the basic idea is that we, from a single fiber, we can build up a model of the entire leaflet. And then we can come up with optimization points to say that we can do this in a, in a parameter estimation context. And it's a pretty robust approach because there's a very clear minimum. And the basic idea when you pull it out is that you can actually predict the mechanical properties strictly from shape and structures. If you know the structure of the leaflet, at least approximately, you know how, how the shape deforms as it's loaded, you can back out to a reasonable approximation of the properties of the leaflet. And we actually were able to do this here, and you can actually see this in different loading conditions. So this is actually something completely new that you could actually add to a diagnostic protocol. So the overall idea is that we have architectural information from population averages, uh, inverse models, pre-strain measurements on a patient-specific basis, pull it all together in vivo to be able to come up with bicuspid and tricuspid valves that are either be high risk for calcific aortic valve disease or not. And there's some recent data, by the way, that I've seen that, of course, the majority of patients with bicuspid valve disease actually don't exhibit dilation of the aorta, but primarily exhibit calcific aortic valve disease. So this is uh, very important. So things where we're going in the future, um, one of the things we're looking at is how do we relate this all down to the cellular biosynthesis, which is driving all these disease processes. And we just recently completed a study where we take strips of valve tissue and we can actually cycle them at different strain levels and then see how the cells respond. These are some genetic arrays from strains, either from static to 30% strain. And it's a little hard to see here, but essentially what you see here are genes being upregulated at higher strain levels. So again, this goes back to what I was saying about the sensitivity. And while we haven't done this for the aortic valve, for the mitral valve repair, even something as standard as an AP ring, um, what you, we can do is see what the changes in the leaflet strains are simply from the application of the ring. And they're quite substantial. The radial direction, not too much, but the circumferential direction has a huge drop in strain from the AP ring. We put this into our cell models, and we can actually show that the normal cells get deformed up to here in the normal valve, but when you put the ring on there, that gets dropped quite considerably. And we think that this has a lot of implications for the fact that while this repair works very well uh, for the short term, in the long run, uh, these repairs tend to fail for a whole range of reasons, and this is a very complex etiology. But what we're able to hear do the first time is really try to connect those scales together. Uh, this is probably a way to kind of summarize that.
So what we found from these in vitro measurements is that the cells need to be deformed within this range to maintain the normal synthetic phenotype. If you over-deform them, they actually go into a hyperphysiologic mode where they really crank out a tremendous amount of proteins. Now, interestingly, if they're underloaded, which is something you don't want to think about it, they actually begin to shut down and they tend to produce much less. And this may be, have a deleterious effect in the long run on the axillary matrix of the valve. Now, just to wrap up, these are fluidic devices, and of course, we want to be able to study them as they operate. And so it's taken us uh, about four years to develop these codes, but we're looking at ways what's called fluid structure interaction. This is a way of modeling the leaflet and the blood simultaneously. And we use what's called an immersed boundary method. And as you can see here, um, if you don't use that, the mesh is uh, very distorted, but here you save that problem. And this is actually what we're able to do both in, in terms of experimental validation. So this actually could eventually be matched to a patient uh, and pulled out. Now let me underscore something, and my mechanical engineering colleagues always say, what about the fluid flow? Fluid flow is important in the valve, but it's the tissue and the exocellular matrix and the cells that are really driving these processes, not the fluid flow. Fluid flow is important because it's the loader. So this is more of an understanding of how it loads. Um, in terms of its ability to work as a valve, it tends to work fine even in very rather disease cases. So I just want to wrap up. Um, I, of course, I actually don't do any of this. I just write the grants and sign the purchase orders. Uh, so uh, but that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's life as a PI. It's all these people on the stairwell who actually do all the work. And of course, generous funding from the NIH and American Heart. Now, thank you very much. <laughs>